Guys, I have something important I need to tell all of you. I know I may lose followers over this, but I will not be silent about it anymore. Racism is bad. And suddenly, he wasn't racist anymore. Why did you say something so controversial? That's so great. So, Friendship is Magic ends and a new generation begins. Generation 4 of My Little Pony to Generation 5. Let me get this out of the way. A New Generation is not the worst movie I've seen. Not even close. Seriously, there's plenty of good things about it. But honestly, it's not nearly as enjoyable compared to Friendship is Magic's opener. Now, I know people might say that I shouldn't be comparing it to Friendship is Magic. And I agree with that on principle. This should be its own thing, and it should stand on its own merits. Besides, Friendship is Magic left a huge impact on our culture that shouldn't be understated. Whatever form its follow-up came from, it would be almost impossible to fill its shoes. That being said, it's hard not to compare the two when A, it's canonically set in the same universe, B, the main character is a fangirl of the main six and their adventures, and C, the show freaking opens with them! If they wanted me to treat them as separate entities, I feel like they kind of shot themselves in the foot here. So yeah, be prepared, because I'm going to be frequently comparing this movie to the first two episodes of Friendship is Magic. If you think that's unfair, well... I don't care. That said, don't worry. This isn't going to be 40 minutes of complaining about how events in this contradict the world-building and lore of Friendship is Magic. I mean, yeah, there's going to be a little bit of that, but I promise it won't dominate the review. So, what could this movie achieve in an hour and a half versus Friendship is Magic in 44 minutes? Well, let's see. Here's my review of My Little Pony, A New Generation. I'm looking out. Overall, this movie was pleasant to look at. I think my only complaint with the visual style is that the faces are not as expressive as Friendship is Magic, but that feels like a nitpick. There also weren't a lot of beautiful magical effects or fantastical locales, but that feels like a silly thing to complain about because the whole story is about not having those things. It's kind of like complaining that Aang can't firebend on day one. You see what I'm saying? Because of that, I can see there's a bigger emphasis on symbolic and non-diegetic visuals during some of the musical numbers, which are pleasant enough. They were trying to work with what they had, so it feels mean to pick on it too harshly in this area. Now, I was worried that the shift to 3D would slow down the general movement, and yeah, it does. Thankfully, it's not as bad as it could have been, but it's still a significant step down. Their attempts at slapstick comedy are... bad. During the expo scene, I was more worried about Sunny getting seriously hurt, if anything. I wanted to laugh at the running gag at the pony tied to balloons, but I usually felt more of pity, if anything. In general, the cartoony bits needed to be more cartoony. It was too slow and realistic. And when I'm talking about magical flying ponies, that's saying something. And because of that, the action wasn't very good. Mostly because it feels like nothing significant happens and nothing the characters do matters. And I'm going to get into that in the next segment. So, in the grim brightness of the far future, magic is gone and the pony tribes are divided once again. Why the Wendigos haven't come back, I don't know, but whatever, who cares about following the rules set forth by the universe? We need to talk about how racism is bad. The only clue we have to all this happening is history class. To be fair, I'm not going to expect everything to be explained immediately by constant exposition, because this is technically a pilot movie to a new show. We need to give it time to explain these sorts of things more organically, and we need to talk about how racism is bad. Our main character, Sunny Star Scout, is established early on to be the Belle of the story in town. Not the old Belle, where she's just an eccentric that people don't really think much of. No, she's a remake Belle, where she's a social pariah because she dares to challenge norms and the status quo, like, racism is bad. If you think my constant statements that racism is bad is annoyingly ham-fisted, well, that's my biggest problem with the movie. Oh my gosh, it will not shut up that racism is bad! I'm part of the choir, and it's still preaching to me! <sighs> so.
sorry, I, I'll, I'll save that whole rant for the message segment of the video. Anyway, Sunny meets up with other characters and must go on an epic quest to reunite the three pony tribes like in the story she read. And that comes with finding three crystals representing each tribe. But she has to do it fast because a racist Karen has taken her son who is I came here to have a good time and I feel personally attacked incarnate and turns the earth ponies into plankton slaves. Will they succeed? Well, it's a kid's movie, so... Obviously. I guess this is a good problem to have, sorta, but I wanted to spend more time in each locale. Part of me is a little disappointed the plot jumped around so quickly from location to location, because it made the whole world feel... smaller. In Friendship is Magic, we only saw a little bit of Cantrela, but then we spent a good amount of time establishing big areas of Ponyville and showcased mythology with the Everfree Forest. A lot happened in the Everfree Forest, remember that? In a new generation, I can't say I'm super interested in this new Equestria because it feels so empty, especially when nothing super huge happened traveling between each city. We do see a lot of Maritime Bay, but given that we spend most of our time there in the Expo, the Station, and the Lighthouse, it feels very cramped. Was that intentional? I don't know. In Zephyr Heights, we don't get to move around to the actual city a lot. There's the throne room, the prison, the vault, and the ballroom, and... That's about it. Most of Bridalwood is spent in Izzy's house in the tavern. But hey, wait a minute. Have you noticed that a large amount of time in this movie is spent indoors? I mean, we get to see the outside world at points, but the bits we do see feel either like empty space or just generally unimportant. I guess I'm interested to see how past locales have changed from Gen 4 Equestria, but that feels like it's piggybacking off of Friendship is Magic success. There's also a lot of core things about the world that weren't explained. Why did all the pony magic get absorbed into the three crystals? Why did the pony tribes break up again? Where are the dragons? The changelings? But again, let's be fair. This is a pilot for a show, so I think I can forgive it and wait until it gives an explanation there. But I think one of the gravest sins this movie makes with the story is that it feels like the characters don't earn their victory. This is especially egregious in the third act. You know how entangled where, now having experienced life in the kingdom of Corona, Rapunzel sees that she had subconsciously put its imagery into her art and she logically puts two and two together that she's the lost princess? Well, they failed to do the same here because Sunny discovers the Earth Pony Crystal by accident! She discovers it because the sun randomly hit it at a right angle. And another example, Zip and Hitch's contributions to the final fight were irrelevant! They pulled off one of the wheels, but did you notice that affected nothing in the grand scheme of the scene? Pip and Izzy helped with the crystals, but again, it doesn't feel like they did anything special to do it! My point is, these don't feel like great, inspiring feats. It feels like the characters' achievements and success were by luck, rather than ability or strength of character. And that's not acceptable storytelling. It happens so often that when Sunny becomes an alicorn, it doesn't feel triumphant. It elicits a reaction of, eh, why not? Who cares? Why try to achieve anything? Let's just hand out alicorn dumb like lollipops. Overall, the story is pretty basic kids fare. There weren't many twists and turns that shocked me. Who the villains would be? I called for minute one. And the discovery that there was a third magical pony crystal was so immediately obvious and apparent I didn't realize that the characters didn't realize it at first. When they put the crystal together in the forest and it didn't work, I was actually confused as to why they were upset and disappointed. Since there's three pony races, there were three shattered stained glass windows, and there's a hole in the incomplete combined crystal, would it be too much of a stretch to think there's probably a third one? I mean, yeah, it's for kids, but kids aren't that dumb. Oh yeah, there's also an agonizingly long third act mope. Thanks, I hate it. So for this category, I thought I'd start in order of character introduction. Today's the day, Dad. I actually have a plan this time. Wish me luck. Sunny isn't a terrible protagonist. She's likable, positive, her voice isn't annoying, you'd want to be her friend. When we were told way back when that Sunny would be an activist, many in the fandom were concerned that the movie and eventually the show was gonna get, well, preachy. Many were afraid that Sunny would be a caricature of the obnoxiously woke Gen Z activists, but played straight. You know, the ones that inject politics into everything, 
the performative, I want to use my platform to share something important kind of people whose self-righteous fervor drives more people away than it actually brings to their side. Well, she is that, but thankfully it's not as painful as it could have been. And I think that's because the more annoying aspects of this type of character are toned down significantly. She is a little judgy, but she's not nearly as judgy as she could have been. And unlike many real life activists, she wants to lift people up and not drag them down. She's very relatable in the sense that she cares very deeply about the truth. She's very earnest and unmalicious about her beliefs. When she says she genuinely and truly wants to bring people together, I believe her. Overall, they do a good job making Sunny a character, especially one that I want to see succeed in the end. Plus, Vanessa Hudgens performs the role very well. That said, I do have problems. One of the biggest being that Sunny hardly learned anything or grew as a person by the end of this journey. Even the big realization at the end? I understand now. It's not the crystals that need to be brought together. It's us. That's literally what you've been saying the whole movie! Why are you treating it like it's a big revelation? This whole story was just about proving that Sunny was right the whole time. The character growth she does go through is essentially inconsequential. The only things that changed about her beliefs or personality is that she learned that some of her stereotypes were wrong. What do you freaking do? Amazing character development, 10 out of 10. Izzy did the same thing, where's her Alicorn status? And compared to Twilight's growth, Twilight wanted nothing to do with friendship at the start. She had to be shown. She had to change. The introduction was about learning about the magic of friendship and that she needed to learn it. The whole entire show was about how her main characters, all of them, were flawed and needed to grow. But hey, flawless heroes are sometimes a thing and they don't always ruin a story. It's not bad that kids should emulate Sunny Star Scout's character, right? She's not a bad person, right? Well, I do find it a little concerning that she constantly hand waves all the damage she does because as long as we accomplish our goal, that's all that matters and it's never addressed. And there's another big thing, but I'm saving it for the message section. Citizens! It is I, Sheriff Sprout. Yeah, elephant in the room. Sprout looks a lot like my OC Firebrand. Like, it's spooky how much. And especially when he goes full dictator. <laughs> I came here to have a good time and I'm feeling personally attacked. Anyway, Sprout is a whiny combative mama's boy and it was obvious he and she were going to be the main antagonists. I guess my biggest problem is that it's hard to take the guy seriously. There's no humanity to him. If he behaved a lot more like Hitch when he was young and then he became this mob dictator later, further pushing the status of foil between him and Hitch, I think the overall message about society's corrupting influences would have been a lot more powerful. But no, apparently he was just always an entitled little turd who tries to skirt his responsibilities and then complain that he's being left out two minutes later. Uh, I... I'd love to, but um, I just gotta clean up my workspace, get my papers in order, and went after Sonny, another solo hitch mission. He's kind of pathetic, really. I guess that's the point if you look at it from a certain point of view, but it doesn't make the character or the story more interesting. That being said, I do like his role and how he's a foil to the next character. I will not eat, I will not sleep, well, maybe a quick nap and a snack if I can't find you in the next few hours. But after that, nothing will stop me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, you're too kind. As I said before, both Hitch and Sprout are established early on to be products of the bigoted society in which they grew up in and also foils to each other. And I actually like how they did this. In fact, I think Hitch is my favorite character in the movie. Small tangent, but bear with me. You know how Ron Weasley was very kind, detested the use of the mudblood slur, and was a staunch ally in the fight against Wizard Hitler, aka Voldemort? Thing is, Ron still had flaws. He was afraid of other species, such as centaurs and giants, and he didn't see the point in liberating the house elves because he was kind of conditioned to see their oppression as normal. 
the separation of the magical species to him was normal, though we as the audience can see it's wrong. Ron was never outright hostile to these other groups, but the ingrained learned cultural bigotry, the mindset of separation, I am here in my place and they are in theirs and let's keep it that way, is apparent in his character. Obviously, he grows up and unlearns these antiquated mindsets and that's what triggers the big kiss in the book. It shows that bigotry can be unlearned through patience and compassion, but it also shows that a decent person who is loving and kind can also have prejudices. It's not black and white. It's layered. Layers! Onions have layers. Ogres have layers. Good characters have layers. You get it. They all have layers. Hitch is very similar. Even though Hitch is obviously the good guy of the duo, he's still a racist. But interestingly, he's not unlikable. He's helpful, funny, and genuinely cares about the safety and happiness of the people around him. Sure, he's got an ego, but in the same way that Tony Stark had an ego. They're narcissistic and full of themselves, but they're not devoid of compassion. I've always found these sorts of characters fascinating, especially the idea of a bigoted good guy. It makes them nuanced and complex. Given that he's also in law enforcement, he honestly reminds me a lot of Reggie Rowe from Infamous Second Son. Once they're introduced to the source of their prejudices, the story doesn't shy away from how it's a bumpy journey to change the way they normally think. And again, he's a foil to Sprout. Hitch and Sprout are both in law enforcement, both have prejudices, and both have big egos. But I think what sealed him as my favorite character in the movie was this scene here. Come on, Sonny, what did you think was gonna happen? You give a little speech and what? Every pony just magically welcomes unicorns and pegasi into Maritime Bay? You keep saying there's nothing to be afraid of, well then prove it. He's out of line, but he's right. He feels the most real. In the first place, he doesn't immediately shut down Sunny's ideas like Sprout does. In fact, he clearly asks for proof about her position. It's clear he doesn't actually believe her, but he's left himself open to have his mind changed by the truth. Eventually. When we're young, we like to think that we can change the world if it would just listen to our important ideas. However, in real life, a single speech changing someone's mind is the exception rather than the rule. Many times, people are very set in their ways, and it can take multiple, multiple one-on-one -on -one conversations Heck, sometimes even shoving proof straight into someone's face doesn't work. Because most people don't like to change. Unlike Friendship is Magic, this movie is mature enough to show that a musical number, or in this case, a single speech, doesn't always change someone's worldview. Until it's undercut by that exact thing happening at the end of the movie. Spoiler alert. You know, you're an Earth Pony, Argyle. You should really start acting like one. At least for her sake. Subtlety, thy name is not Phyllis Cloverleaf. Yeah, I get it. It's supposed to be a more realistic and relatable and relevant villain. But you gotta admit, Karen and her twerp son hardly compare to the threat of a thousand-year-old demigod. It feels like the less funny table scraps of the fairy godmother and Prince Charming from Shrek 2. That said, there is one thing I do like about how she's handled. Towards the end, she realizes, oh no, I've created a monster, and takes responsibility, and it feels natural and doesn't feel forced. Up until the last minute when she doesn't want to face it anymore. So close. It's called Research Phyllis. And by the way, I leave all the brainwashing in Maritime Bay to you. This one is going to be short, but hey, it's comparable to his lifespan. Yep, Argyle is a Disney dad, and that he's too pure and likable to stay alive past Act 1. How did he die? No idea. I'll explain later. Next. Ta -da! How can anyone hate this precious bean? Yeah, there are a lot of similarities to Izzy and Pinky. They're both kooky, optimistic, airheaded, hyperactive, and often in their own little world, but they still manage to feel distinct from each other. Mainly because Izzy has a stronger creative slash spontaneous side, while Pinky is more in touch with her organized slash planner side. 
But oh my gosh, she is so freaking adorable. She's like a little puppy. Not once did she ever get annoyed for me. She's so bubbly and cute and God, I just want to snuggle her. You'd be surprised what some wires and good lighting will do. But I'm just so tired of living that ridiculous lie. That's why I come down here to get away from all of that. So yeah, Zip is obviously the athletic slash tomboy one of the group, but she's distinct from Rainbow Dash, being that she's not a jock. She's more strategic and more of an independent thinker. We don't spend a super big amount of time with her to know her as a person as much as I would prefer, but they make up for that by making her a major catalyst who still contributes a lot to moving the story forward, especially compared to... Pony seriously needs to explain why this thing was so important. Pip is, I gotta be honest, I found her to be kind of a shallow narcissist. Yeah, she likes singing, but I feel like we didn't really get to know her. Her official descriptions about caring about her audience and caring about being a good influence feels so thick. I mean, if she was different behind the screen, maybe confided about a few fears or dreams or just something. She feels exactly the same on screen as she does off. She just felt empty as a character. Again, maybe it's because we needed to spend more time with her, but ugh, this movie had double the time as Friendship is Magic's pilot, as well as fewer main characters, and it couldn't even accomplish that? I'm not sure Pip even needed to be here. She doesn't contribute anything special or unique to the group's quest. Oh, she grabs the crystal, somehow evading the entire crowd of people who are trying to arrest her, and still managed to actually grab the crystal? It doesn't feel justified, especially since the crystal accidentally falling out in the first place is really flimsy. She helps them escape Zephyr Heights? Hitch or Zip could have done that, especially since, oh, we don't actually see it happen. Yeah, the escape? It happens off screen. It's like Pip helped Sunny win the dance-off? Yes, he could have done that. What does Pip actually bring to the table other than being just a walking joke of, I'm a social media influencer. Isn't that funny? No comments and no photos. Okay, one photo. Queen Haven and Alpha Biddle feel less like characters and more like plot devices. They just exist to be defeated by the heroes and be symbolic of the old ways. And I feel like, once again, the background citizens are easily manipulated and act in whatever way the plot needs them to act. Example, Karen Mom hosts a big expo event to showcase laughably awful anti-unicorn and Pegasus gear. And Sunny isn't invited, so cliche dictates she must bust in and embarrass herself. But it's not done in the way you might think. This gear almost severely injures her, and it shows on full display to the audience how the stuff they're crafting does not work. Any normal society would have reamed it in the press or dismantled it themselves, but no. People still think it's 100% safe as they build the giant death robot later. I'm sure whether to complain about this because, hey, it was like French of his magic. Unicorn horn makes a unicorn stride. It's the more head on your forehead, it's the source of your pride. And of course, there are a lot of pop songs in this. And it's because we had different singers or composers, but these felt very different from the fair we got in French of his magic. While I can't remember the lyrics to most of them, I do remember enjoying the music on its own for the most part. I've hummed a few of them throughout my day. However, the upbeat ones like Gonna Be My Day, I'm Looking Out For You, and Fit Right In all have the same problem. Each one spends time saying racism is bad, and because the movie is incessant with this message, it wears on me and brings my enjoyment of all of them down. Now that I got that out of the way, I'll try and say individual things about these songs. Gonna Be My Day is a fun and upbeat tune. It's very well performed and I love how it sounds and it does its job establishing what's going on at the moment. I'm Looking Out For You, honestly, is a mediocre number. It kind of came out of nowhere. The emotions it's portraying didn't have a lot of buildup and I don't like how it's essentially glossing over anything interesting in the journey and contributes to the feel of the world feeling smaller and empty. Danger Danger is really catchy, not gonna lie. The instrumentation is fun and yeah, it got stuck in my head and I was humming it for a while. It seems like these composers really know how to make good earworms. And I see what they're trying to do with the message of this song. Sort of a hybrid of Beauty and the Beast's mob song and Pocahontas' Savages. That said, both those songs are better because they had better build up and had more believably competent villains. Gaston was already loved and trusted by the town and they saw the beast as something new and frightening. Rat 
Ratcliffe had already been portrayed as sneaky and opportunistic, plus he had the advantage that John Smith, a liked comrade, was in danger. Sprout, on the other hand, when has he ever shown competency or leadership? The other ponies thought he was a joke and he constantly took advantage of them. I understand they're scared, but I find this very hard to believe. Plus, the lyrics are... Let's enter a blind, irrational state! This is no time for sober thinking! If you follow my orders brainlessly! Ma, 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 angry, angry! Ma, 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 Patronizing. What is it trying to say? That angry mobs and riots are stupid, childish, and nonsensical despite participants thinking they're cool? Wow! So clever! That'll really show those racists the error of their ways! Glowing Up is the sort of vapid, inspirational pop tune I was expecting to appear, and yeah, it feels like a poor man's try-everything. Fit Right In is another fun and upbeat song. However, the rap section was very how do you do fellow kids and I wish this franchise would stop trying. It's Alright was absolutely forgettable. I don't remember a thing about it and re-listening to it did nothing for me. And finally, Together is repetitive, samey, and platitudinous. Honestly like many of the MLP finale songs, so I can't get too mad at it. The humor is... okay? There were things that made me laugh. Like, Izzy's zaniness was usually good for a chuckle. The unicorn superstition running gag was a riot. And I liked Hitch's playful ego as well as the running gag of him and animals. And overall, there were a few good zingers sprinkled in there every now and again. However, I noticed I chuckled less and less as the show went on. I think I can chalk that up to my increasing frustration with the frequent unsubtle presentation of the movie's message. I also feel like a lot of the social media humor is a few years late to the party. I don't think they're bad jokes, but I've heard these jokes before in DuckTales, Ralph Breaks the Internet, heck, the Emoji Movie beat them to it! You hear that? You lost to the Emoji Movie! Something is lurking, something is near, something is feeling stranger, stranger, stirring up. You know what empathy fatigue is? What many don't seem to realize is that our ability to relate to and care for others, aka our empathy, is a limited resource. If we insist and demand that everyone care about everything all the time, it drains our empathy reserves. We start feeling irritable, depressed, exhausted, obsessive, and so many other negative emotions. Constantly demanding people care makes it harder for people to care. So when this movie quite frankly bludgeons us with the message that racism is bad, it feels counterproductive. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad message. I agree, racism is bad. But for me, as someone whose line of work requires him to spend a lot of time on social media, so I'm seeing all this performative activism being shoved in my face 24-7, I cut the cartoons to be entertained and to escape from that. I need a break for crying out loud. I want to explore vast new worlds, watch daring adventures, see characters overcome great hardships, develop and become better people through it. I'm here for stories and to be inspired, not to get preached at. Black people can't marry white people. Hey now. It's Garnet from Steven Universe. Kids, that's no good. Again, yeah. Racism is bad. You shouldn't treat people who are different from you like they're lesser. But if VeggieTales can get that message across more effectively and efficiently in less than half an hour, there's a problem. So I'm compelled to ask this question. Who is this movie for? Seriously, who is the audience for this? Activists? Again, it's preaching to the choir. Racists? Oh, you really think they're gonna look at this movie and think, Oh, hey, maybe I shouldn't be a piece of crap to others who are different than me. Especially when you portray them as whiny man-children, Karens, hustlers, and bullies without a hint of nuance? The only thing I can think of is that this is only for the kids, and, well, yeah, I can accept that. My Little Pony is and has clearly been mostly for kids since its inception. Both boys and girls, but mostly just for kids. The belief that it could also be enjoyed by adults is more of a 
modern development. And let's be honest, racism is bad is far from the worst moral to instill into the youngins. So I guess there's no real reason to get upset, right? Not entirely. For one, I'm really surprised at how quickly the fandom seems to have shifted its tune. Is My Little Pony just for kids? Because many of us were pretty insistent that Friendship is Magic could be enjoyed by adults too. I mean, this joke is totally for kids, am I right? That badge was creating an unhealthy power dynamic. You know, for kids. Plus, I can't even count the number of times this Disney quote or this C.S. Lewis quote were thrown around in its defense. But I do see the point in that kids' movies need kiddie moments. Sure, Lion King had the darkness of the stampede scene in Mufasa's death, but it also had Hakuna Matata. Bambi's mom died, but it also had the spring song immediately after. That said, both of these are movies that can still be enjoyed by kids that are as young as three, all the way up to adults, and things don't feel mismatched. So I'm a little frustrated that the standard seems to be doubled. However, there's a good argument to be made that this movie is more morally foundational, giving the most basic of basic messages about bigotry a la Horton Hears a Who or VeggieTales' Are You My Neighbor. After all, you don't start kids off with algebra, you start off with basic addition and subtraction. I agree with that point, to an extent, as there are a few things about this movie that kind of kneecap that argument. For one, a similar movie, Zootopia, is rated PG, as is this movie. They're both deemed appropriate for the same general group of kids, especially since these movies came out within five years of each other, claiming one is specifically for older kids and the other isn't seems a little subjective. Second, just because the message of a story is at its core good, doesn't mean that excuses bad storytelling. Execution always matters. Environmentalism. You can be Captain Planet, or you can be Sonic Sad AM. You can be the Lorax, or you can be Princess Mononoke. Or heck, Girl Power. You can be Captain Marvel, or you can be Wonder Woman. Prejudice. You can be this movie, or you can be Zootopia. Yes, Racism is Bad is the core message of Zootopia, and it's not very subtle. You can get that's what the movie is about from almost the very beginning but it's not the only thing it talks about. It spends time showing off an interesting world, letting you get to know fun characters, presents a tense mystery, and this is the big one, it makes complex points about its basic message. It talks about how even those who have been discriminated against can still be bigoted when push comes to shove, and that's something that needs to be watched. There's the basic foundational message of racism is bad, and there's also another, more complex message for older and more cognizant audiences. Racism is bad no matter where it comes from, even victims. And to its credit, a new generation does have this dichotomy in the form of Hitch, as I explained before. The foundational message of the movie is racism is bad, and the more nuanced message is racism is bad, and good people can be prejudiced, and it takes time to unlearn. A good message, heck, a great one. But the problem comes with the villain, especially since Sprout and Hitch were intended to be foils. I think it really hurts the message if Sprout was always a remorseless, racist little turd. Imagine the kind of story we could have gotten if the rest of the movie was treated with the same amount of finesse that was given to Hitch. Imagine if Sprout and Hitch were mostly similar as kids. You can tell society's conditioning is getting to them a little, but they don't seem actively malicious or fearful to other races. At least not yet. There's more hope for Hitch because he's allowed to hang out with Sunny a lot more, but because Sprout is very intent on avoiding the ire of his overbearing mother, he's very adverse to contradicting her opinions. He should be less like a rambunctious kid and more like a controlled child. This magnifies once they grow up. Sprout's close proximity to Phyllis built a stronger wall around his prejudice, while Hitch's close proximity to Sunny made his figurative wall much weaker. It's still there because he's still in this bigoted society. Neither of them are awful ponies, but Sprout is a little less forgiving of Sunny's antics than Hitch's. 
Overall, I think this dynamic should be more like the Aesop of the clay and the rose. It also makes the scene where Phyllis realizes she created a monster a lot more powerful. Instead of being treated as a dumb joke, this should be treated as a tragedy. Because let's be honest, being taught to hate is a tragedy, and treating it as a joke when you also have something as realistic as showing the slow process of unlearning makes the movie come off as really flippant and patronizing. Thirdly, notice the length of foundational stories such as Horton Hears a Who or Veggie Tales Are You My Neighbor. They aren't very long because they communicate their message in a bite-sized piece. They bludgeon you with it, yes, but it doesn't last very long and there's other things besides the message. This is one of the big reasons that the movie adaptation of Horton Hears a Who wasn't loved as much as the original story. It didn't need to be as long as it did. So much of the movie felt like filler for a point that was stated more simply and effectively as a short book. And we have a similar problem with A New Generation. Because the rest of the movie felt so empty and small, there was little else to chew on other than the basic message being constantly repeated so it can make you almost feel trapped. My point is, it feels a bit like a trying to eat and have the cake situation, and this can severely damage your movie's message. When you try to make more nuanced points, other simpler parts of your story are in danger of falling apart under scrutiny. And unfortunately, this movie falls for this hard. In several key areas, the movie seems to be a little hypocritical. After Izzy and Sunny flee to the lighthouse, they get themselves into a situation where it's natural and perfectly suitable within the story for these characters to try and get to know each other. However, they don't talk about interests or likes or anything. They talk about racial stuff. A concerning level of focus about racial stuff. I understand the reason countering misinformation and understanding others who are different is important, but it's a wee bit uncomfortable that these characters seem to see each other less as people and more as race representatives. This also happens in the elevator. Sonny keeps asking racial questions and the guard replies that he likes to collect sneakers. Oh, that's unique. Could you talk more about that? Nope, moving on. And this goes on for most of the movie and she's never called out for it. Did you notice that in her big speech to try and convince people in the expo, as well as originally questioning Izzy and the guard in the elevator, that Sunny seems to place an inordinate amount of attention on other races' abilities and physical traits rather than them as people? Instead of talking about being friends with someone new because they're also ponies, it's more about what their race is capable of? To wit, Sunny seems to care more about what they are rather than who they are. It got to the point where I was waiting for her to start describing others as exotic. Now, if this is actually addressed in the story, I'd be okay with it. That would have been an incredible thing to talk about. Like, I would have inserted a scene like this right before they entered Bridalwood, especially to develop Pip further because Celestia knows she needs it. Pip is looking a little glum when Sunny comes up to her with her journal. Hey, Pip. Question, are your wingspans the same as your height? Uh, sometimes. That's mostly just a- Great! So Earth Ponies have a rumor that I'm pretty sure isn't true. Do you guys bathe in giant bird baths? Not really. That's kind of- So since you guys can't fly, do you ever go somewhere to just glide or something? I mean, it would have been better to have a friend that can fly, but once we get all the crystals, we can finally- Lavender. What? My favorite color is lavender. Thank you for asking. Uh- I never asked that. Yeah, you didn't. Izzy did, though. So, friend, are you going to ask me about who I am or whether or not I feel okay now that you've basically ruined my life? Or are you going to keep asking me about my wings because they're the only thing about me that seems interesting to you? Oh, uh, sorry. I didn't mean to. I know. I know you didn't. I'm just overreacting as usual. No, 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 you're not. I mean this, Pip. I didn't mean to ignore how you were feeling. This has been hard on you, and I've been taking that for granted. And I'm sorry. I want to be your friend because you're a pony, not because you're a pegasus or a princess. You really mean that? Yeah, I guess I just got a little too excited to meet some pony new and learn the truth about everything that's happened. I was missing the trees for the forest. What a coincidence, because there it is! Ta-da! 
With this, it would allow both characters to develop, and it would show that even our main character has some growing up to do. But nope, Sunny's already perfect. She's right about everything, and she's always been right about everything. The only thing she's wrong about are small, innocuous things that she won't get called out on too harshly by anyone. And if it is harsh, well, they'll just be proven wrong eventually. Lovely. I'm not going to go as far as to call her a Mary Sue because she isn't one. But dang does this movie make it tempting, especially with the ending. See, pay attention to the obstacles they needed to overcome in Friendship is Magic versus A New Generation. In Friendship is Magic, each obstacle was tied to a virtue, exercised in a critical moment when it was needed most so they could succeed on their quest to save the world. And Twilight experiencing those virtues and recognizing their value was what granted her victory over Nightmare Moon. In this, well, think about it. What obstacles does Sunny face that her friends assist in overcoming? They teach her how to manipulate their respective cultures to best get what she wants from them. You get that? Instead of teaching her to be a more virtuous person or a better friend, her friends teach her how to better lie and steal. And she is rewarded for this by becoming an alicorn. Showrunners, you guys don't see a little bit of a problem with this? I also find it a little hypocritical that the villain song talks about seeing in black and white, you know, being ironic. But this movie can't claim itself as enlightened and call out black and white thinking when it also presents the entire conflict as black and white. If everyone would just listen to Sonny's important ideas, things would be better for everyone. For complex issues like bigotry and misinformation, the story is irritatingly reductive. Oh yeah, and if you're trying to make a statement about xenophobia, maybe it'd be more effective if you didn't have the foreigners frequently brag about being snaky. Honestly, if you're looking for a kid story that does the whole racism is bad message with a little bit more finesse, just go watch Zootopia. Am I the problem? Seeing as how so many people watched this movie and loved it, I almost feel like I'm missing something fundamental. Like, the problem is with me and not the movie. I'm honestly surprised it got such a good score on Rotten Tomatoes, but I think part of that is the bias the general populace has against traditional 2D animation. Overall, A New Generation isn't a terrible movie, but... I can't find many reasons to recommend it. And look, I get it. Being simple about a message for young ones isn't terrible, especially if it's an important message like racism is bad. However, I'm not going to excuse bad storytelling just because it has an overarching message I agree with. And just because it's for little kids, that's not an excuse to be bad. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I forgot that My Little Pony is only for little girls and no one else is allowed to enjoy it or criticize it in any way. Silly me. Oh, uh, Friendship is Magic what? It's like this franchise has Schrodinger's demographic, I swear. Also, I'm beginning to see an appalling lack of empathy and compassion from a number of fans who see any criticism of the way this movie's message is handled, electing to write these detractors off as racist. Ironic, seeing as how this movie for kids directly called out black and white thinking, but apparently you're still allowed to think in black and white when it comes to defending the movie's message. Complex opinions? We don't need those. Don't question the herd. You aren't a bigot, are you? And given how self-indulgently platitudinous the movie was, I'm not excited about the show that's coming after this. I'm afraid the show's episodes are just going to be more of this. Heck, I'm half expecting the first episode to be about getting vaccinated and Sprout and Phyllis are going to be anti-vaxxers and... Ugh. I guess I'm mostly just bummed because I haven't been inspired to make much MLP content lately, and I was kind of low-key hoping this would rekindle that spark. And the only thing this thing lit in my heart was the fires of annoyance and the smoldering embers of disappointment. This was supposed to be their best foot forward. If this is the direction they plan on going, it's going down a path I can't follow, so unless the show itself is different from this, I'm out.